So are you really nervous or really excited? I'm really, really nervous. You may kiss your bride. Do you guys have anything you want to say to the bride and groom? Yes. It was a beautiful oh, wedding. It was gorgeous. Jordan and Claire, love we love you hey. so much. Look, Crystal, look. Oh my gosh, Lacey. What? What, what are those? Where's everybody going? What, what, what are you? Oh my god, what's happening? What's what are you? What, you got, why am I going? Oh god. Yeah. This is the end. This is actually the beginning of the, of the end. Um, we're talking about the last, the end times, the apocalypse, the revelation, the, the end of the, of the story, as it were. And we're going to look at that a little bit here today. And we're going to take a look at some things that Paul said. Now, I just got to do a little disclaimer and tell you that I am not the most brilliant theologian out there, Okay. And so one thing that we're not going to be able to do in the 20 minutes uh, that we have today, I should really check my watch, I have about 20 minutes or so, half hour that we have today, is to be able to walk through everything the Bible says about the end times and Jesus' second coming. You know, do you know that 20% of scripture is prophecies? All kinds of different prophecies. And there are more prophecies in the scripture having to do with Jesus' second coming then it was his first coming. His first coming, of course, you know, coming and he died for our sins and rose from the dead. But the Bible has a lot to say about it. But it is insanely complicated. You've got stuff in Daniel. You've got stuff in Revelation. You've got stuff in stuff in Thessalonians. And, and, and I have a, a fair grip on, on these things. Um, but we're, we're not going to get that deep. I'm just telling you right now. So if you're coming looking for... You know, uh, to know exactly when Jesus was coming. I don't got that for you today. We just had one, you know, once every couple of years. Once every couple of years you hear somebody who's got an idea of when Jesus is coming back. It's going to happen on this day because of the Mayan calendar. Remember that one a little while ago? The Mayan calendar, the world is going to end that day. And every time you get one of these world, the next time actually the world is going to end, and, and you think the world is going to end, let's just make a little bet, okay, and see if the world is going to end. And if, uh, and now you say, but well, betting is against the scripture, right? Well, just tithe on it, and then it's okay. No, I'm just kidding. Um, okay. <laughs> when that day comes, all right, when that day comes, and, and if, if the world ends, you win, okay? If the world doesn't end, you can you can pay me, okay? And, <laughs> But if you look in the scripture, we see that people have been looking for the end since the beginning, at least since Jesus came. And in Thessalonians, that's kind of what we find. We find that the Thessalonian church are thinking a lot about the end times, and they were getting concerned, they're concerned about the order of the things that are going to happen. So we're going to take a, a quick look at, um, at the resurrection at the second coming, and kind of a little bit of the order that that happens, okay? And so in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, it says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died, so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. Now, this is a scripture that I use in, in funerals where the person who has passed away was a believer. I used it once in a funeral where the person wasn't a believer, and that was more than a little awkward. Um, and now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died, so we do not grieve like those who have no hope. When we're Christians, we get to grieve in a different way than other people do. When our loved ones know Jesus, because we get to see them again. And the Apostle Paul is, is, is trying to is encouraging them. And so it's a real typical funeral verse. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse starting in 14. Now I've got to read a chunk. It's not on the screen. I apologize for that. But, but just try to listen uh, carefully. It says, For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised again. All right? These are Christians. Since we believe that Jesus died and was raised again. We also believe 
that when Jesus returns... Now, let me say this. If you stand here today and you say, I believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead for my sins, the same Bible says He's coming again. He is coming again. And so I just want to encourage you, that is part of this gospel that we preach. That He's coming back for His church that He has won at such a high cost, okay? God will bring back with Him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet Him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. First, the Christians who have died... They will, be, they will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. And this is already their custom. It's the uh, word Maranatha says, the Lord is coming. And that was part of their greeting for the early church. When they would, they would clasp hands and say, Maranatha, the Lord is coming. They're looking forward to this time when Jesus is coming back. And so i got some good news for you today. The first one is, is that my Jesus is, in fact, coming back for His church. In John chapter 14, verse 3, it says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. Will you say that? Say, I will come back. That's Jesus talking to you. I will come back and take you to be with me so that you will be where I am. Did you know that's been the whole point of everything from the very beginning? From the very first prophecy that said Jesus was coming. By the way, that prophecy is uh, God is speaking. And it says to the serpent, her heel will strike your head and crush your head. They say that's one of the first messianic prophecies that Jesus is coming and is going to break the power of sin and death. But from the very beginning, the whole point has been very simply because Jesus misses you. He wants a relationship with you. This whole religion thing is all about one thing. And that is that God loves you and He wants to be near you. That's the whole point. And so Jesus says in 14.3, John 14.3, so that you can be where I am. That's what this is all about, so you can be where I am. Now, for the Thessalonian church believed that Jesus was returning soon, okay? I believe that Jesus is returning soon. I, there are a lot of people out there now, when I was young, and Ingrid Lisa and I were dating, and then we got engaged, I kind of thought, you know, Jesus, I appreciate you coming soon, but you, if you could wait for two months, that would be awesome. <laughs> because we were trying, we weren't doing any, sorry, no hanky-panky going on, okay? And I was thinking, Lord, I, you know, I don't want to die like that. Anyway, and so... <laughs> So it's like, but Jesus is coming back, okay? And we're, and we're supposed to look forward to it. We're supposed to look forward to it. And, 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 and it, it, I, I do, we're just joking about that. But listen, Thessalonians 4.14, we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And we believe God, that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep. People who have died. Now this word sleep is the same word for sleep that Jesus uses in talking about Lazarus. And it was a polite way of, 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 saying, of saying death, you know, that he's just sleeping. But it, it meant that he, was, that he was dead. And that's the word that is, is used here. And it says in a, verse 16, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel. Now, what's going to happen is, there is going to be a trumpet call. There is going to be a heavenly shout, the likes of which the world has never seen. Now, this is, I mean, because this is, this is end game. This is, this is the last thing. This is pulling off the gloves. There is going to come a shout and a holler from heaven. There's not going to be any questions as to what is happening. And when that shout happens, the Bible says that the dead in Christ will rise first. In other words, they will be caught up ahead of us. Now, I have this really neat video of like they're acting this out. And you can see out of the graves, people coming up. I have no idea what it's going to look like, but it's going to be extremely cool, right? One way or the other. And out of the graves, the dead in Christ will rise first. And after them, 
The Bible says we will meet him in the air. We will meet him in the air. We are literally going to be caught up or rescued with him. As the Bible uses that word that's used in the scripture is rescue. We are going to be rescued with him and meet him in the air. The greatest victory the world has ever seen, because this is the culmination of everything that's been happening since, gener- since Genesis. Jesus' death and resurrection, our lives, this rapture, this being caught up and meeting our God in the air, this is the moment that we've all been waiting for. And there's gonna, when we get there, there's going to be two kind of judgments. We might look at that a little bit next week. Revelation 20 verse 6 says, Blessed and holy are those who are part of the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. The second death has no... So blessed are those who are part of the first resurrection. Now, you have a choice to make. We all do. You have a choice to live once and die twice, or to live twice and die once. What are you talking about, Scott? Well, (laughs) what I'm talking about is, Jesus one time was talking to a guy, and he said, how can I be perfect? How can I be right? And Jesus tells this guy, you need to be born again. And the guy even gets irritated with Jesus. And he says, how can I be born again? Do you want me to crawl again into my mother's womb? Pretty graphic. He's talking to Jesus. And he says that, and then Jesus says, no, if you believe, you can be born again and made new. Now the second death, how do you die twice? Well, in the scripture, the first death is our natural death, or the sleep that we just talked about, this um, this polite word for death, where we, we're all going to die to get to the next step. But the other thing is that there is an eternal death, just like there's an eternal life. And I'm not going to dig too deep into this, but this is not a ceasing to be. According to the scripture, the second death is just a, uh, it's a torment in an awful place called hell. That's why the, the stakes are so very, very high in all of this stuff. And so, <laughs> anybody ever hear of YOLO? Okay? It stands for you only live once. YOLO. Well, I'm here to tell you that you can live twice. It's kind of right. If people say YOLO, you know, kind of the same guys who say, hey, dude, hold my beer. And then they're going to do something stupid. <laughs> anyway. <coughs> number two, the living Christians are taken away. So the dead in Christ rise first. Then number two, the living Christians are taken away. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. After that, we who are still alive, I mean, this is going to be really cool, right? We who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. That is going to be an incredible day. Now, this word, caught up, means to be seized or snatched or saved or rescued out. Now, there are some opinions on there as to when Jesus is actually coming to get us. Okay, and this, some of these words might um, might work out. The first one is pre-trip, which is what I am. I believe that because of this verse and some others, that Jesus is going to rescue us. That we are not going to have to endure the tribulation. Okay, and so we. Are, uh, so I am a pre-trip guy. All right, I believe Jesus is going to come and rescue us. Right now, there's another school of thought out there that is mid-trip. Okay, mid-trip people think that the tri- that Jesus is coming back. In the middle of the tribulation, right? Mid-trip. And then there's a third camp of people, post-trip. They believe that Christians are going to have to go through the entire tribulation. And then the uh, fourth is a pan-trip, which is no matter what happens, it's all going to pan out in the end. That's not true. That's not, not a theological term. It's not a three-word. I didn't, I didn't make those. Okay. Um, but it's all, But I'll be honest with you, I, I'm free trip. I think the Bible has, there's a few verses that we can look at, we can know that. But I'm actually mostly pan trip because I think it's, if, no matter what, when Jesus comes, I plan on going with him, right? <laughs> I'm going to go as soon as he comes. So it's not one of those things that's worth getting too hung up on. But uh, I decided to mention it because it's, it's uh, one of the things that people argue about sometimes. Matthew chapter 24, verse 39. Now what's this going to be like? I mean... And so Jesus, he's telling his disciples about his return. And he's trying to communicate to his disciples what it's going to be like. And this is what he says to them. He says, this is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in a field. 
One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding grain with a hand mill. One will be taken, and the other left. Verse 44, So you must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect Him. Now, one kind of fun thing, anytime somebody says, Jesus is coming right now, you know it's not going to be then. <laughs> okay? Because he says in his scripture, Jesus said, I'm coming when you aren't expecting me. It, like a thief in the night. I think we're actually going to read that verse here in a minute. I'm coming like a thief in the night. You don't know when it's coming. And there's going to be two people walking down the street. One will be taken and one will be left. You see, all of a sudden, all of these abstract concepts of the Christian faith matter. What did you do with Jesus? I'll tell you what, I think that there's going to be some people in our world and in our churches that have been living a life that their, their gospel has been a self-help gospel and not a save me from hell gospel. And I think that there's going to be some surprises on that day. And Jesus even talks about that in another parable that he's sharing. He, he talks about a, bu a bunch of people that thought they were serving him, but they were missing the point. The point is, is that there's going to be two people, there's going to be families sitting down to dinner together. And some are going to go, and some aren't going to go. There's going to be friends who are going to be having coffee together. One will go, and one will stay. Jesus is trying to paint this picture to his disciples to help them to realize, guys, the stakes are really high. This isn't pretend. <coughs> He hadn't even died and rose from the dead yet, but he's, he's beginning to paint this picture that, this, guys, it is serious. It's serious. The stakes are high. Now, I have a question to ask you. Do you know what the difference is between clothies and nudies? Anybody? Okay. Uh, no, okay. Clothies are people that you, you guys actually wear clothes when you go to bed. And nudies are people that don't wear clothes when you go to bed. Okay? They say that. So, yeah, so there's only really two kinds of people in this world. you got clothies and, and nudies. And now, who, who here is a clothie? Raise your hand. Okay? Anybody? All of you who didn't raise your hands, you're gross. Just saying. Okay? <laughs> See how I did that? You're shy, you didn't raise your hand. Um, okay, but there's, there, are, there are nudies and there are clothies. Okay? Now, I, now, those of you, now a lot of you are nudies. Uh, because you didn't raise your hand. And so I, I, this next verse that I'm going to read to you is really important for you. Okay? Because, I mean, Jesus kind of knew that you were going to be wanting to be in nothing. Right? And so Jesus, foreseeing that, he's thinking of everything for you here. Um, he's thinking through that. Uh, he, he gives you us a verse. It says, uh, this is in Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. Jesus says, Behold, I come like a thief. There's that word, thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him. <laughs> so they may not go naked and shamefully exposed. Revelation 16, 15. So Jesus is looking out for you nudies. Okay? And he's giving you a heads up here today on, what is the day today? November 17th. That when the rapture happens and you are rising up and you're not wearing any clothes, Jesus told you so, and just so you know what his preacher did today. Okay? So, okay, it's possible it's metaphorical. Okay? All right, it's po possible that he's not right. But I'm just, just in case though, all right? You might want to, you might want to have some boxers on, you know? Um, <laughs> You know, it's, 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 you know, uh, yeah, it's, okay, maybe a metaphor, but just in case, you just don't know, all right? Um, you just don't know. Behold, I come like a thief, lest as he stays awake and keeps his clothes with him, so you may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Okay, we should move on. There's going to be a reason, so Jesus, he is coming back for his loved ones. But there's going to be a reunion. Christians are going to get to be with God forever. Thessalonians uh, 4.17, it says this. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with Him and meet Him in the air. We've read that a couple of times, which is going to be awesome. And so, we will be with the Lord forever. Now, when you are in that place and you get to be with the Lord forever... 
This is a neat spot. And one of the reasons why I love my wife and why she's a strength to me is because my wife gets to see me when I am the most unattractive. Okay? Naked in bed. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, oh my God. <laughs> she gets to see me when she gets to see me when, when I'm when I'm ugly. She gets to see me when I mistreat people. She she's seen the ugliest parts of me. You know, she the people who are the closest to you, they get to know you better than anybody else. That's why her love is worth more to me than anybody else's. Because she knows me and she still loves me. There's a lot of strength that comes from that. Even though she knows me completely, even though I have failed her, even though I, I, she's seen me at my weakest, she's seen me at my dumbest, and she's gotten to see me at my best too, but it's those weak <coughs> moments that we're insecure about. When my wife loves me, and when she shows me that she loves me, there is a strength that comes from that. Because she knows me so intimately and she still loves me. Because sometimes we don't feel that lovable. Multiply that times a million. And you might begin to, to get what it's going to be like when you are looking your God face to face. And He is so holy and so perfect and so awesome. And knows every detail of every moment of every thought of your life. And then reaches out and doesn't smack you in the head like you think you deserve. But he reaches out and he wipes away the tear. And he says, I love you. That is going to be an incredible moment. When we get to see our God face to face. And not only do we, are we going to get to see our God face to face. But we are going to be loved by him. Because we come with Christ Jesus. We come um, forgiven. No more shame. Maranatha. He's coming soon. Verse 18. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. The Apostle Paul speaking. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Thank you. I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians. All the way to the end. As Sam begins to pray, I just want you to listen to these words. It says, listen while I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable. We're going to get new bodies. Imperishable. And we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable. And the mortal must clothe itself with immortality. Verse 54, Then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. So verse 55, Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? But thanks be to God that He gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when I'm looking at my God face to face, it's not my holiness who you're looking at. It's because of Jesus. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. He's coming back. And He's coming soon. Now, if you're here this morning, would you take a minute... And go ahead and pull out those prayer cards. The smaller of the cards, and just get them in your hand for a minute here. And we're going to be receiving the offering in a couple minutes' time. This morning, I want to ask you a question Are you ready? Jesus said, Be ready. There's, there's other parables he told that said the same point. Be ready. Because we don't know when he's coming. But we know he's coming. And when that day comes, all second chances are done. That's it. Not one more chance to love one of our family members. Not one more chance to 
invite someone to church. That's it. Are you ready this morning? No. You say, you know what? They've been expecting Jesus to come back from the very beginning. I don't think he's coming back in my lifetime. Can I tell you this? We may or may not be in the last days. But I do know that I'm in my last days. I need to do the only days I get. This is the only shot we get to take. So what do we do about it? The Apostle Paul tells us right here, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. I wasn't planning this this morning. Um, but it kind of goes along with our team rock forms that we have out there on the table. This thing called the church what we're trying to do here, what churches around town are trying to do this morning, it's only really for one purpose. And that is so that heaven is bigger and hell is small. That's what all of this is. Every Bible study, every Sunday school class, every step of every ministry, it really only has one goal, a thousand different ways. And that is to try to get heaven bigger and hell small. Can I tell you this morning, no matter who you are, there is only one way of living that has any value. At least 10,000 years from now. 10,000 years from now, it's not going to matter how much money you have, how much fun you have. It's not, the only thing that's going to matter 10,000 years from now is what you did for God. And specifically, what you did for the people that you love and care about on this planet. And we, we get to take nothing else to the other side of eternity except other people. That's the only thing we get to do. So I can stand here and, and boldly tell you that serving your God it should be the highest priority of your life. I would even take another step further and say it should be the only priority of our lives. You say, well, Pastor Scott, all the, what about my family? What about all these things? It all points to Him. It's all about Him. The stakes are high. And when you labor for the Lord, your labor is not in vain. I was at a pastor's conference last week and we preached on this a little bit. And when you work for the Lord, your labor is not in vain. And I was reminded that one time I was doing a Bible study and I don't know where it really was or my um, book or whatever. And I got all ready, I got prepared, and I lined up all these chairs and I was all ready for everybody. And not one person showed up. And that's discouraging, you know. Full rooms are always more fun than small rooms. And I said, God, I'm not doing this for them anyway. And so I, I, I shared what I prepared to share from an empty room. And said, Lord, my labor is not in vain. What we do for Him is not in vain. We give Him the best that we have. Sometimes projectors don't work. Sometimes Pastor Scott is too disorganized to keep the volunteer system going. And we drop the ball and we fail. And we pick it up and we try again. But our labor is not in vain. As we were getting ready this morning, and it, and you know it's a tough morning. I have five people who when I went to bed last night, I thought we were going to be here this morning helping us set up. And they all had good reasons and let me know why, but I... I was here at 6.30 this morning because we had some things we had to work on. I did the best I could today. And there's a lot of courage that comes from... Uh, so we're, we're getting set up and stuff. And I said to Sam, you know what my trick is? My trick is when everything falls apart, nothing quite seems to work. My trick is, is to say, God, I did the best I could, so now this is all your fault. <laughs> Because you knew I was completely incompetent for the task. <laughs> you know, all we can do is give him all we are. But our work is never in vain. He sees it. He sees it. And he can make it work. So this morning, my question for you is simply, are you ready? 
If Jesus were to split the sky today, what would be your regrets? Would you be able to look at your life and say, I gave it all I had? Or are there holes? Now, there's no condemnation. I'm not looking to make you feel bad today. But I am wanting to hopefully tweak your perspective to what I think is a more realistic perspective. And that's the eternal perspective. Take a moment and look in your life. And if Jesus split the clouds today, where would your regrets be? And I want to encourage you that if you begin to do things for God, His Word says that your work is not in vain. He's a good God. And He loves you. And He's not mad at you this morning. At the beginning of of our talk today, I told you the whole point of this is just so simply God gets to be with you. That's what all of this is. You can go ahead and receive the offer.